Well, thanks for uh, joining us here today, Cliff. Hey, Jack, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. So, you know, I, I know a little bit about you because show me the rental.com, but can you kind of give me a little background? Uh, tell us tell us a little bit about yourself before we get started. All right. Uh, well, the simple, the simple explanation is, is I'm a husband and father of five beautiful children. Um, I am now a full-time real estate investor, and I like to spend my time traveling and um, showing my kids different parts of the country and uh, educating them and uh, talking on podcasts. I just this is re- a recent uh, journey for me, so I'm enjoying doing that. That's great. Like, so you you jumped in full time here now. How did you start in the whole real estate investing? So when I first started, I was like everybody else. I had that. I had a job. So uh, I'm, I'm from a uh, lower, I guess, lower middle class background. Uh, my parents were always, you know, go to school, go to college, get a job. That job will take care of you. And the same old routine most people are accustomed to. So my first real job was I was an outside plant technician at AT&T, um, which is a fancy word for construction worker. So mm-hmm. for 10 years of my 20s, I was working the bucket trucks and putting up fiber and uh, Sometimes, a uh, few times I'd travel uh, different states when they had storm damage and I'd, uh, you, I'd be that guy that was in a bucket truck putting up fiber, climbing the poles in the backyards. And I did that for uh, quite a few years. Um, I got into real estate from actually my brother-in-law, a guy named Kevin Cuccinelli. He and my sister were both uh, in the army and were both in Iraq and they came back from Iraq and uh, he was real big on a guy named Robert Kiyosaki, who most uh, mm-hmm. real estate people have heard of. Yep. So he introduced me to uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and then we played a game called Cash Flow. And I can remember, uh, I mean, they couldn't have been back from the war for, you know, a month. And we were playing in my parents' living room, and I don't know what it was that was just so in- intriguing to me, but just uh, being able to, I didn't know you could buy houses and rent them and, and make money and then sell them. And um, I, I just, it wasn't in my, you know, expertise at all. So that kind of sparked the interest and kind of got the uh, hamster turning in my brain, running that wheel. And uh, from there, I decided that I wanted to do into real estate. I had, I had no idea what to do. I had no idea how to do it. I just know I wanted to do it. So I actually hired um, Rich Dad Porter had a coaching class and you can mm-hmm. hire these coaches. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, um, it did get me into it. They helped me buy my first duplex, which was a horrible deal. And um, it, the coaching wasn't kind of the coaching I should have got. I didn't know it at the time, but it all worked out. So I bought my first duplex uh, through that coaching class and in the time of getting loans on it and talking to these different mortgage guys, uh, and I don't remember his name for anything, but one of the mortgage loan officers told me about a, a local real estate club in our town called CREA. And so uh, I didn't know that existed. So I started going to these real estate meetings. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I was there, uh, the first time I was there, I, I actually the first meeting, there was a guy named Mike Butler on stage He's talking about Roth IRAs. And I, I don't know what it was about him, but I was just intrigued by him. He's a very cool guy, very good speaker. And um, the next day, I actually went to his office and uh, asked him to help me with real estate. Mm-hmm. Um, he kind of, uh, if some people might know Mike, he's been a teacher for a long time, but he kind of made fun of me for a little bit because I told him uh, I had a duplex and I was so proud. You know, this, you know, kid didn't come for much. I had a, had a house and I was, you know, thought I was big time. And so he made fun of me for the house I bought because I didn't realize how bad of a deal it was at the time. And then he kind of took, I did a coaching classes with him and he kind of took me under his wing. And at that time I was still working a full-time job and I just started buying houses while I was working my full-time job. And I just started um, slowly doing that process. And I started liking real estate more, the more I got involved with it. I started educating myself a lot more and going to different seminars and just kind of, um, I was, I was engulfing myself in the business. Um, and so from there, um, I wanted to kind of, this was about a six year process. I was up to probably about 20 something houses and I was doing, I thought, okay. Um, but the houses were, were decent houses, but I, I had a good job. So, I mean, I thought I was living high on the horse. Mm-hmm. And I didn't like my job so much. It was getting to the point where, um, actually when I first started it was Bell South. It was a great, I liked Bell South a lot. They were very more family oriented, very more, um, I liked the, the, the way they hand, they treated us. And then AT&T bought out Bell South and then they came in and I want to call it browbeaten. So every mm-hmm. time when you're in construction, if anybody's worked it, you know, there's going to be things that go wrong. There's going to be accidents and different things like that. Well, AT&T was very strict on basically you, if you got hurt in any way, shape or form, you got in big trouble. Mm-hmm. And so uh, there was a couple incidences where I got suspended 
And I thought they were no fault of my own. Uh, one time I was actually parked on the side of the road and an old guy backed into my truck and I got suspended because I was told I shouldn't have been parked there. Hmm. And so these little telltale sounds started happening and there was more things coming, but I was like, I just don't like it here. And uh, I knew I really liked real estate, but I didn't have the guts to just quit because I didn't have a college degree. At that time I was making 80 to a hundred thousand dollars a year, which is a lot of money for a, for a kid or for anybody. Um, right. I didn't want to walk away and not have anything to fall back on. And so, um, I, you know, my, my, Mike Butler, my mentor said, you know, when, when you want to quit, you'll know when it's time. He goes, I can't tell you that time. There's no, I can't tell you just no, like your gut will tell you and you no. Know. So I felt that in my gut, but I didn't want to quit. So I actually got suspended on purpose. And, um, and so I'm actually proud of this. I owed the longest uh, suspension in an AT&T history. I was suspended for four and a half months. No. And so, uh, yeah. So what I did was at the, at driving a bucket truck, you had to have a CDL license. And when you had a CDL license, you got randomly drug tested. And so when I got random drug tested, uh, it just so happened at the time when I was wanting to quit, but didn't know how, uh, didn't have enough vacation, vacation built up to do it all at once. And so they popped me with a drug test and uh, I basically said, you know what, I'm not going to take it. And if you don't take it, um, it's considered a fail. Mm. And so um, basically I failed a drug test and then I had to go to counseling. And so in, in counseling, um, the counselor was actually my next door neighbors. Um, I, I'm sorry, my aunt and uncle's next door neighbor. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I knew him, very cool guy. And I kind of told him what I was doing. He kind of laughed at me and shook his head and said, I think you're crazy. And I said, well, we'll see. Time will tell. And so I took an eight hour rehab course and turned it into four and a half months. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot of little stories and I had a couple of grandmas die and a couple of family emergencies and I just drug it out so long until uh, finally my boss said, uh, you either come back or you're fired. And I told him, well, you know what? That's an easy decision. I quit. And so um, in that four and a half months, I did real estate full time and I was 100% into it. And there's something about that momentum when you, yeah, something's new and fresh to you and you know, you really love doing it. And you know, I was working eight, you know, 15, 18 hour days every day. And I was just, I was, it wasn't really work. I was really loving it. I have, I, it was so much fun. And so what I did was I became a uh, buyer's agent, a uh, foreclosure buyer's agent. So mm -hmm. this was around 2007, eight, nine. And uh, at that time, you know, the, how the market was. So I was a foreclosure agent and I was killing it. Uh, I was showing people houses, um, making great money on foreclosure. I still had my rentals. And then in this time frame, there was a big niche in our market for a lot of these foreclosure agents. These banks wanted them to fix up the houses. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to sell them as is. They wanted to do some remodels to them and they couldn't find anybody to do it. So I just kept listening and, and listening to these different brokers around town. And so I started a GC company and started remodeling um, bank foreclosures. Mm -hmm. We did that for around three or four years. And I built that business up pretty well. And off of that branched off grass cuts. And then we did property preservation and we changed locks and we did set outs. And then I started getting my fingers in every aspect of real estate I could think of and building up my um, real estate very big. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the problems with that was, um, as I said earlier in the show, I was a husband. I, I am a husband. I, wasn't, I am a husband and father of five. So the thing that I was you know, all this money is for and all this, you know, stuff is for is for your family, Rob. They were very much getting neglected. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of put money as the goal and not the tool. So I was engulfed with this stuff when I, I never turned it off. So for several years, uh, it was some rough years at home. And luckily my wife stuck with me and we worked it out. But there was times when even when I came home, I was working. I was, I was basically nonstop all the time. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so what that caused was I thought I was doing what I was supposed to do as a husband and as a father, but I was really, I was providing for my family, but I wasn't really providing if that makes sense. No, and it makes so, a lot of sense. Yeah. And so something had to change. And so, um, yeah, it was great. We had a nice house. We had toys, we did fun things. Um, but it wasn't a lot and I was never present. And mm -hmm. I can remember, um, sitting at home at the kitchen table. And at that time I had so many things going on. If I had a couple empty rental houses, you know, my phone's blowing up, text messaging back and forth. Uh, and I can remember, I can still remember sitting at the table, my wife just livid, just pissed off, uh, not yelling, but just, just so resentful. And um, it, it got to the point to where we were not, I mean, we argued more than we got along. And, and so I just realized, you know, something had to change. This mm -hmm. stuff's great and I'm doing pretty well financially, but you know, all the stuff I'm trying to work for is I'm, I'm going to throw it all away because I'm putting money as the goal and not the tool. 
And, and so what we found out is um, the biggest problem we had was lead screening. Mm -hmm. and, and so what that was is we had a bunch of empty rental houses and we would get, I mean, literally 40 to 50 phone calls a day per house. Sure. Not so you were, you were being the playing property manager on top of doing all the construction, every, I mean, that being a property manager alone is a lot of work. Yes. So, and I had people on my, I had staff, um, but the right. problem was when we had two or three, so, so when we had two or three empty rental houses, you know, I just had one guy. I mean, you're talking about at that time, probably, you know, 40, 50 houses. I mean, it was a lot, but not a whole lot. Right. And so, um, but he couldn't handle the phone calls either. And so I would help out and we kept finding out that we kept asking the same questions over and over. Uh, when we lead screen, we tell them that they call up and everybody that has a rental house understands this. You call up, mm -hmm. I got a three bedroom, two bath, uh, 1100 square feet, rents for this, blah, blah, blah. You give them the whole spiel and then you got to listen to their story sometimes for 10 or 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be a jerk. So then you're just like, oh yeah, I understand. And they tell you all their life story and, and we just, our, our same questions were over and over. Are you on section eight? How long have you been on your current job? How much money do you have in the bank? Um, and we'd ask this stuff over and over and we were like, you know what? We should automate this. this is, there's no reason that we can't automate this. And so I looked around and tried to find a system I could get into that does it. And um, we couldn't find anything. And so we created one and that's where we created a company called show me the rental. And, and, and basically what that does is it gives you your time back. Cause in my opinion, the biggest crap part of the property management business is lead screen. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just so time consuming and you wait and so waste time consuming. Like it's not a good use of your time because you don't want to talk to the people who are not qualified. You want to get to the people who are qualified and then deal with them. Mm -hmm. and, and so we created a, an online system that advertises, uh, generates leads, pre-screen the leads and then automates the showings um, to turn basically your leads into paid applications. And then from there um, you kind of take it from there. So this was built out of necessity so I could kind of get my life back uh, mm -hmm. because I was just nonstop working and working. And, and um, it was just, it was a horrible, at the, I didn't realize at the time, but I wasted about three or four years of my life just working nonstop. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I regret it because I missed some of my older kids uh, field trips and stuff that I don't, I, I don't take for granted at all anymore. So mm -hmm. for the last few years, I've been changing my priorities and, and now I make money the, tool and not the go. And now I kind of, I kind of put life first and put the business second, which is a uh, easy to say when you got some money, but that's kind of the goal for everybody. I think is to the, right. think that money is going to get you to a spot where you can relax and have fun. But I think in the beginning, you need to have that understanding of if I can help anybody on this podcast is to live an abundant life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for me, it's teach my kids how to live an abundant life, not to just go out and grind and the money's going to make all your dreams come true does make life easier. I'm not going to knock that, but it doesn't make you happy. It doesn't get, it doesn't get to that fulfillment if that's what you're looking for. Sure. So, so. You know, with, with all of that, like, can you, can you put into a nutshell, like once you got this figured out the show me the rental.com and you're, you're now automated this. Um, I know it, this was just one aspect of your business, but how much time did that actually, did that start to free up for you? Like when did that, because I'm sure it took a while for you to di get this automation dialed in too. Yeah. So what it does now is before, um, what we would do is when we had, like I said, two or three or four empty rentals, it was so overwhelming. We would just put fires out. I was mm -hmm. just put in the wrong tenants in the wrong houses. And just, I actually had a lot of the wrong houses that I didn't want my portfolio based on the lifestyle that I, I, do, I have now. And, and so what it did is, it actually weeded out all the crap that we didn't need to talk to and got the people that were, you know, pre-qualified. And, and so think of if you're a real estate agent um, and you are, you're a buyer's agent and you want to show somebody a house, well, you don't just go, sh somebody calls you up, you go show them a house. You make sure they're pre-approved. Uh, you make sure they can afford it. And you kind of get to know them and kind of screen them a little bit before you, so you know what kind of house to show them. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of the same thing. You're basically pre-screening these leads. So, you know, okay, what house do you qualify for? Don't call about the, $1,300 house when you only make a thousand bucks a month mm -hmm. or 1200, you know, you know, so um, it just takes all of that headache of talking and dealing with the wrong lead. Sure. Um, and it just, so, so now um, I tell you that that was my old business on how I just was, I kind of did everything and ran it and oversaw it and micromanaged. So now what I do is I have a, a administrator assistant. I have two VAs 
mm -hmm. I have one property manager. My property manager handles um, all the leads now, does all the application, does all the leases, handles all the maintenance issues on my houses. Um, I collect the rent, make sure everybody pays. Um, my other VA, my VA uh, does seven day letters, evictions and collections, and we work on different projects that I need work that I need help with. And then she is very organized where I am not. And she kind of puts those th pieces together. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have another VA who does some awesome bookkeeping for me. And so I meet with them where before I was just all over the place and work 15, 20 hours or 15, 18 hours a day. Now I literally work two or three hours a day. But now what I do is I have weekly meetings with my staff, with my VA and my property manager. And then besides that, I, I wake up early in the morning. I kind of do my little routine and then I come in the office for around two hours. And if I focus and shut my doors and lock my window, you know, lock my window, shut my doors and kind of block out the outside world and work for two hours, not, you know, pretty hot and pretty heavy. I can get everything done for the whole day. Hmm. And so that's kind of my routine now. Um, where before, if everybody does real estate, you can make it a 24 hour a day job if you wanted to. I oh mean, yeah. As long as hard. It just depends on what your priorities are and what you, you know, what you're trying to accomplish. So now you have a property manager and you probably with, with all of your experience, you probably have quite a few qualifications or questions you should ask that property manager when you make that selection. Do you have some tips there? That we had, like, if you're a property manager, what would you ask that property manager? Yeah. Like if you're, you're selecting, like what, what are some important questions you would, you should ask a property manager? So my answer is, um, my honest answer is nobody is going to manage your houses better than you. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to care as much as you do because it's not their house. Um, if I was asking a property manager, I would want to, I would want somebody who is actually in the business and this is what they do. Mm -hmm. So, so in our town, so my specific, you know, I got a bread and butter houses. So I've kind of over the last five or six years because of the market was so hot. I sold off a lot of my, I call them headache houses and kept my A and B houses. I call them mm -hmm. A, B and C and D houses. I got rid of all my C and D houses, kept my A and Bs and upgraded to better A and B properties. Sure. And so what I do for my business and my lifestyle, I have a particular type of cookie cutter house that I want. I want a, a one story brick ranch with a basement and a garage. Mm -hmm. So for me and those type of houses in my area are great because the maintenance on them is very low. You have a single sure. hip roof, you have one plumbing stack, you have one washer and you have two bathrooms and a kitchen. Mm -hmm. And so I like to set my houses up from the beginning. So their they're la the longevity is set up. So we spend a lot of money in every house we buy now, rental house, and we redo all the plumbing. I don't care if it's good or not, but we, we run pecs and we have certain ways we run pecs and we have new drain lines and then we upgrade the electric and we kind of stop the big problems up front because you know, in our town, I'm sure most places, you know, 80, 90% of all your maintenance calls are going to be plumbing or HVAC. Mm -hmm. Those are your main calls. So we set them up very nice. We, we do 90% furnaces in every house now. Um, so we get rid of the uh, vent and the roof, which is called, which is another, you know, vent, um, I'm sorry, vents leak, whether it's from your furnace, right. your plumbing pipes or whatever. So we kind of set our houses up a certain way now to, um, back up on some of the repairs. We don't have nearly as many. I mean, we're lucky if we get one call a month now mm -hmm. uh, because everything's set up nice. Now in 10 years or 20 years from now, we'll, you know, we'll have to redo things, but we set them up for the beginning just right. And so we don't have a lot of calls because I think when you're a, you're hiring a property management company, if your house isn't set up right, or you don't really know what you're doing. You're going to get a lot of maintenance calls and a lot of issues that are going to cost you money mm -hmm. uh, because they're going to charge a lot more than, than what you can do it for yourself. Or if you have just a maintenance guy on staff. Sure. So, you know, you, you've kind of uh, defined like what your, your ideal house is, but is there like, how do you decide your, your numbers defining your buying strategy? So for my, I, I, I base my business on my lifestyle now. So I know if I can get A and B properties, which then I can attract A and B quality tenants mm -hmm. or customers, uh, I'm not going to have headache. So right. if I'm in, and I got a lot of investors and I'm not knocking different parts of town, but if you're in like a high cash flow part of town, yes, the math looks good on paper and I'm not knocking that at all, but your management intensive in those areas. Mm -hmm. It's going to have those type of people where rent is probably like third or fourth, sometimes fifth on their monthly priority list where my house is now rent is their first priority. Mm -hmm. So I make sure I have those houses. One other thing we do is we make our houses extremely nice. So um, I brag a little bit because I make sure if, there, if there's a rental house in my area, which 
there's not a lot in the neighborhoods I buy in anymore, but I got the nicest house. So I got granite countertops, tile backsplash, vessel bowl sinks in the bathroom, new roofs, new windows, everything in there's nice because I ask a little bit higher for rent, but I know I can, I can attract that type of quality customer that I'm looking for. So I won't have those headaches. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, one of the tools we ask when we screen now is do you have tools and can you do small jobs such as, you know, um, turning a breaker on and off or snaking your toilet? Uh, because I don't want those calls. I feel like we're all adults here. If you have a problem, I know the house is set up correctly from the beginning, which is very important on our end. Mm -hmm. And if there's a problem, it's probably caused by the customer because they did something to it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's how we run our business now. Because now, like I said, I have five kids. We, my wife works for the local uh, high school in town. And so she's off all summer. So we travel all summer. And it's very nice to know that I'm not going to have a lot of headache while I'm gone. Everything mm -hmm. runs pretty smooth. And that's and we set our company and our houses up in, in that way so we don't have that problem. So you, you enable your, your residents to do some of this minor repair work themselves? or If like a toilet stopped up, yes. I expect sure. them to snake the toilet. If the, if, the, if the stove isn't working, I expect them to know how to you know, flip a breaker. If the AC isn't working or heat's not working, we expect them to know, hey, go to the thermostat and check your batteries. Sure. You know, do, do some minor things. Uh, but no, if there's a problem, of course, we'll send somebody out. Uh, but I guess the point back to your property management, what kind of property manager to hire, you know, we set our houses up in a way so the property manager doesn't have much to do besides collect rent. If you sure. have a property manager, because um, if you don't set your house up right, there's houses you're just going to have maintenance every month. Mm -hmm. uh, you're just going to have problems going on because you didn't, you got galvanized pipes for your plumbing and they're starting to cave in or you didn't um, put the new sewer clean out in outside and, and set your houses up from the beginning. So you can do easy maintenance on them. Sure. You know, I'm, I'm going to go back to what you were talking about at the beginning of, of our conversation. What I, what I think is really interesting and what I think a lot of people would like to hear is how you turned it around so that you're, you know, how ways to run the business, ways to run the business without it running you, you know, in, in the way that you've set it up now, you're talking about two or three hours a day. Um, I wish I could say that. I mean, I'm, I'm doing what you're, you just, you just got out of, you escaped that 12, 18 hour a day, uh, roller coaster. Um, do you have some question. tips, tips or something there? Like what, what did you do there? Give us, give us some, uh, give us some it ideas. Would, it's funny. Um, there's not a magic pill. So I think, you know, I think everybody's strategy and goals are different. So, one thing that worked for me is um, there was a guy named Bob. I want to say Bob Steele from, mm -hmm. um, oh, where's he from? Baltimore. And one of my, a guy named Mark Hall. So I used to be, a, I was my broker, super nice guy, investor also. We went out to lunch with Bob one day and uh, Bob, I said, so I always ask people who are experienced or a lot older than me to go, you know, what did you do? Or what would you do different? Um, how would you structure things? And, and so what he said is he literally was so overwhelmed with all the work he was doing. He took a piece of paper drew a line through it. The top half of the paper, he wrote things that he likes to do. The bottom half of the paper, he wrote, on, he wrote things he doesn't like to do. Mm -hmm. He ripped it in half and he went out and found somebody and hired somebody to do what he didn't like to do. And he said, I didn't have any money to hire those people at all. I had no idea. All I knew is that if I had time to do what I loved doing and had enjoyed what I did, I could make a lot more money. Mm -hmm. So I kind of set my business up on those same principles. I don't think there's a end all be all because everybody's different. I do not like data entry. I think it's a nightmare doing mm -hmm. quick books or anything like that. It drives me up a wall. So that was one of the things I don't like doing. I don't like talking to tenants anymore. It's just not I've kind of been there and done that. And, and so I hired, you know, my, my manager to, he screens everybody. He talks to him. He's got to deal with the maintenance issues. Um, what I like doing uh, Jack is I love doing this stuff. I love show me the rental. I think it can save people a ton of time. And I like, I spend my time now doing talking on podcasts. I think this is fun meeting people like you last summer. We took an RV and we traveled uh, out West uh, mm -hmm. for 40 days. And along the way we stopped at different RIA clubs and different uh, shows. And we spoke, I spoke and, and uh, my kids got to enjoy it. And we went from Arizona to California to Oregon to um, Wash or to yeah, Washington and then Utah. Um, and so I ran my business mobily. So so I don't know what everybody's plan is I, or, or what to do for everybody, what everybody should do. All I know is I know what I wanted out of my life and what my strategy was. And so I spent the last several years putting that in place. And one of the big things I wanted to do was be mobile. Mm -hmm. and, and with technology today, it's very doable. 
um, as long as you understand it and know what you're doing. And so like we use a property management software company. Like I told you before, I have two VAs. And mm -hmm. so I can, I can set up Skype anywhere in the country that I'm at as long as I got an internet connection. And, and so I kind of let them um, run the show. And, and one of the models I heard uh, that was very enlightening to me was done is better than perfect. Mm -hmm. um, and so what that means is, yeah, my property manager, a great guy, one of my great friends, is he going to do it as good as I'm going to do it or exactly, exactly as I want to do it? No, but if, if I can do what I want to do with my time and he can get it done, then I don't care. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and it's just minor things. So when I remodel a house or, or uh, uh, rental turnover, he might do it ex not exactly how I want it, but it's really daggone close and it saves me. It keeps me out West with my kids in an RV versus mm -hmm. back here um, working. And so I think you got to make that decision for yourself and everybody does on what their strategy and what their lifestyle and what they want out of their, out of their business. Um, I just decided that, you know, it was, it was destroying my family and it, it's great to have a bunch of money, but if you have nobody to spend it with or, or share it with, uh, and you're eating dinner alone, um, it's not worth it. And so, mm -hmm. uh, my wife loved this product. Of course, I can now have dinner at home and actually be present with my kids and talk to them and engage with them and, and joke where before I was just basically, I was just physically there, but mentally I was, you know, 20 other places. I think that's a really interesting, uh, exercise that people should do. You know, that, that concept of drawing a line across the piece of paper simply and, and defining your job what you're doing today and, and def deciding, do you really like doing that or not? And maybe it is something you outsource. I think with VAs today, um, I don't know why you don't. So I have a, um, uh, I'll tell you about VA. So I, I, I hired a company called the profit. I want to say profit factory a guy named Tim Ferris. Yep. Tim I know Francis. Tim. Yeah. Not I, Tim Ferris. Tim Ferris wrote the four hour work week. Correct. Yep, yeah. Yeah. Wrote, yeah. Not Tim Ferris. Tim Francis is the guy okay, that I, yeah. 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 I don't know Tim Ferriss. I, I would love to. He's a super cool guy. But uh, I listen to his podcast all the time. But I hired a guy named Tim Francis because I had, I had a, when I was really hot and heavy, I had a full-time office lady. Um, and it just didn't click very well. Um, I didn't have enough work for some days. Some days we were busy. Some days we weren't. And, and, I, and she was the wrong personality, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I need somebody more detail-oriented um, and more kind of telling me, you know, what's going on today, what I need to do. And she was not. And so we butted heads a lot. And then I found Tim Francis. And, and what they do is they actually take these, diff, they're called Kobe tests and different personality tests. And then they go out and match you up with um, basically stay at home moms. So there's a lot of moms and people out there who have kids and decided, hey, I want to stay home with my kids, but I would like to make extra income. Very mm -hmm. smart, very educated. And so he, he uh, matched me up with a, uh, um, with a woman and she is, her name's Jennifer and she basically runs my show. She does a great job. And so she compliments me in areas where I need help with, um, which I used to like, I hated sending out seven, eight letters. I was always slow on rent increases, um, collections. They were just so much of a hassle. I never did them. Mm -hmm. And so she, that pay, that, that line that I drew on that paper, that was one of the things I hated doing. And she takes care of all that for me. And she does, a, and she actually will do a much better job than I will ever do because it, that's what I, I hate doing that stuff. Right. And so, um, so I meet with her once a week. Um, she's got any questions in the meantime. She's actually, I'm in Louisville, Kentucky. She's actually in North Carolina. Hmm. And so uh, we Skype once a week and she, we do everything through Google Drive and she does a great job. And so I would recommend I get to spend time doing what I love to do. So, so my, my days now too is once I work in the office, we do get leads in and, and I, I work a lot on my Roth IRAs now. And uh, I, I'm just involved now in what they call a solo 401k for a retirement plan. Mm -hmm. And I spend a lot of times, um, I got different goals now for my life. So I have my lifestyle goals, which is just my rental houses. Um, I have a lot of A and B houses. I've sold off a lot of headaches. I got several paid for now. And so my lifestyle is pretty much taken care of. And so now I have five kids. And so I want, I have CISA accounts set up for them and I fund those with deals because uh, it's a tax-free account. Mm -hmm. And then I have a Roth IRA I do deals in. And now I just sort of solo 401k I do deals in. And, and so one of the things I worry about is I, I'm not big on politics and I don't know much about it. I just know that I don't like when people start saying they're going to keep raising taxes. And yeah. so I don't want to work so hard for everything I've built up to start taking 50 and 60% of what I've earned. Right. Um, I think it's insane if they talk about you get to make more money off my, of what I've built than I get to. When they start mm -hmm. talking that way, I think that's insanity. 
Um, and I don't mind taxes, but I think the government wastes a lot. So, um, so now I'm, I'm real focused on tax-free investments. Mm -hmm. Um, so if that day comes, I still got, uh, okay, over here, I still got, you know, several rental houses paid for and, and money coming in tax-free. Right. So where, you know, I, I hate to, to cut us short here, but Cliff, but, uh, show me the rental.com is where people can access your online solution, right? And there's, is there a subscription or how does that work? Yeah, we made it as cheap as possible. Um, because again, I like, I know it sounds, you know, cliche, but, I would like people to, I know what it's like when you first start and you're buying a bunch of stuff and you think how busy you need to be. Um, we made it as cheap as possibly. We made it, it's $49 one time flat fee until your house is rented. Hmm. I didn't want to nickel and dime. I didn't want to do any of that stuff. So it's a very simple, cheap product and for that price. And I think for that price, there's no reason not to try it. Right. And so, uh, and just see what it can do. So it literally, if you could think of a day where, if you had empty rental houses, you don't have to take any more phone calls or emails. Again, it's all automated now. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is um, we don't screen the app application because everybody screens differently. Just like we talked about what works for me doesn't work for you or, or mm -hmm. my lifestyle. Everybody's different in where they're at on their path. Right. So um, I screen a lot harder now than I've ever done before because I want that, that great customer that I don't have to, you know, have phone calls from every month. And we have that house that we can justify that customer. Mm -hmm. So it basically takes all of the headache out. I, I call it the crap part of management. It takes it all out. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't have to screen any more leads or do anything. The system automates the whole process. Sure. And uh, where else can they find you if they wanted more information or I know they can yeah. go to the website, right? But yeah, I love helping people and talking. So um, they go to the website. They can email me at any time at cliff at show me the rental dot com. Uh, they can also call me now. Um, I answer my phones usually between, well, it's a bad time. Um, usually between 12 and one and four and five. So I try to call people back in that time frame. So if they want to call me, they can call me at 502-641-8781. Again, it's 502-641-8781. If they got any questions, um, I'll call them back as soon as I can. And uh, they can do that way also. Yeah. I notice you, you do a time block and, and uh, that's one of those things that I've, I've started to do myself because otherwise uh, your schedule can get away from you, can it? Yeah. Again, I think it, comes <laughs> back, it, can, it can, yeah, you can literally make this 24 hours. We talked earlier. You can right. literally do this all day long. And when you get distracted, so if, if I'm focused on one thing in the mornings, um, that's why I do it in the morning because I don't get a lot of phone calls. Mm -hmm. I can literally get things done. But when I'm doing something and I, and I get five phone calls or somebody stops in my office or some, you know, all these other distractions, that one thing that should take you a half hour, 40 minutes takes you four hours because you never get to just focus on it and knock it out. Sure. And so I think that routine, you know, I'm big on routines now. So every night before I go to bed, I'm not perfect with it, but I do a certain routine in the mornings. I get up and I do a certain routine and kind of end my day on a good note and start my day on a good note. And then mm -hmm. I just enjoy my days a lot more. Um, right. It's funner. I know that's not a word, but I like that word. I have a lot. I'm, it's funner now than it's been in the past. Sure. And I always end with making sure, was there a question that I didn't ask that you wish I would have? Um, no. Oh, well, you know, one thing I would like to add is, you know, my, my life started getting a lot better financial wise when I started getting out of debt. Mm -hmm. So one of the big problems I had in the beginning is I was in so much debt. Now it was good debt. But I mean, I had a big nut to crack, you know, thirty, forty thousand dollars nut to crack every month in mortgage payments. Right. So that gets stressful if you got a bunch of empties and a bunch of stuff. But you know, I think your lifestyle is so important. And I'm a I'm a Dave Ramsey fan. I don't like everything he says, but I like a lot of his basics of get out of debt, mm -hmm. build up an emergency fund, um, pay for college, you know, start your retirement. Um, I think if people can get out of debt, they can make a lot better decisions. And, and we, when you're not in debt, when you're debt free, you're not a slave to your money. Right. Um, you, I think that, that, that was a big turning point in my life when, okay, I got a lot more coming in than going out. Even if I have some empties, I got a lot of stuff paid for now. I don't need as much stuff, um, because I got paid for stuff. So, mm -hmm. you know, 10, 10 or 20 paid for rental houses, you know, unless you're just crazy with money, you can pretty much do whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. Um, in my mind, when I started, I went a hundred. That was my goal. A hundred houses. That's what, for whatever reason that number was, I have no idea, but that seems like that's what a lot of people want. And a lot of big time guys in my area had a hundred. So I was like, I don't do what they do. Mm. Well, to get to that hundred, man, that's a job. I mean, unless you want that, I'm not knocking it because some people love it, 
but that's a job. I mean, you're always going to have a turnover. You always have something going on. Mm -hmm. But if you got 20, you know, 15, 20 houses paid for nice areas uh, with good income, um, you know, that, that freedom is what I was looking for. So that's what worked sure. for me. No, that's a great way to end this. I uh, really appreciate your time, Cliff. Uh, I think uh, especially when we're in the, in the hustle and the grind of real estate investing, it's really important to refocus and understand what, why we're doing this. I, I, I've mentioned in the past, we don't want to have our what interfere with our why. Yes. Um, but uh, I really appreciate your time and, and reflecting on some of that. Jack, I really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for letting me share. Yeah, thank you, sir. And we'll uh, hopefully have you back. This episode is brought to you by FargoTurnkey.com. Do you live in a good cash flowing market? If so, Turnkey isn't the best choice for you. You should buy in your market. If you don't live in a great market for investors, where can you find profitable cash flowing properties? We love the Midwest where prices are reasonable and the people are great. Ever heard of North Dakota Nice or see the movie Fargo? That's where we live. We personally invest here and have lived here all of our lives. How does Turnkey work? We find the property, we rehab the property, we find you a tenant and place you under the care of our local property manager, who we trust with all our own investment properties. I'm sure you have questions about how the process works and what to do next. If that's the case, fill out the form on FargoTurnkey.com and we'll reach out to see if you are a good fit for our business. We have a limited supply of properties every month, so we can sell only to a few qualified buyers. See you at FargoTurnkey.com. I don't like to tell a man what to do with his money, but if you ain't investing in property, then you're dumber than a dummy. I'm not dumb. I'm smart. Well, buy property. That's my advice.